Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying after the first lecture. Uh, we, if you remember, we're discussing with you spectral, pro spectral properties of matrices and linear maps via association with matrices. The routine part we discussed already quite extensively. I mean, the computational side of the business we discussed quite extensively. Today we just dis I start discussing. I'll start showing to you. I'll start showing like why exactly we, or one of the reasons why exactly we the spectral analysis is so valued in 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 many applications. It's the our objective will be to. Our objective will be to link every matrix to a diagonal one. And that's, that's a big advantage, actually, when you have this link between the matrix and the associated diagonal one. Many, many things, many applications, many questions and applications where matrices appear, if you can link that matrix to a diagonal one via spectral analysis, many questions become a lot simpler to study, to answer, and all that bit. Um, right, so I'm going to show you what exactly people normally mean by, by the term diagonalization. It's a connecting the matrix to a diagonal one and how the spectral analysis, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are helpful in this regard. Well, we will start this from, you will find it a bit maybe distant, uh, but eventually it will, it will all come together. You'll see why we need this. But before we go into this, I just want to go back to what you know, I hope very well matrix multiplication and I would like to revisit matrix multiplication and I'll show you some extra structure in the way we normally multiply matrices you know how to do it on the, like on the computational level the, I hope you remember I, I hope you know it by now but I'd like to show some structure in this iteration uh, some row and column structure that's why I call this slide structure of matrix multiplication so I'll, I'll have two matrices A and B like this they are of compatible size. You see, this is the size of n times n, and this is n times k. So here, the number of columns is n. The number of rows here is n as well. So they are compatible in terms of multiple. We can multiply them. The, the algorithm of matrix multiplication allows me to multiply them now. But what I will do is this. I will, I will think of this matrix A as a something which consists of columns. So this little a1 little a2, little am, these are the, sorry, rows, the rows of my matrix A. So here they are. So each little a1, a2, am symbol, it's a matrix in its own, oversized one row, m columns. Okay? So I'm, I'm giving a particular structure to my matrix, a row structure, little a1, a2, a3, am, they represent the rows of my matrix A. For B, I'll, I'll give it a column structure. So B1, B2, Bk, all together we have K columns, will be the symbols representing the columns of that matrix, okay? So each little, little B1, little B2, little, little Bk, it's a column vector, or just one column matrix of N rows and one column. Here we go. I would like to just see what happens. I, I would like to show you what happens when you multiply A and B and you try to identify explicitly what happens to each row or each column. That's what I call structure of matrix multiplication. So look at this. If I multiply my A and B, the result will be a matrix. We know what the size of that matrix will be, right? It just will be M rows and K columns right in here. That's right. But Column or row wise, this result AB, it will it will have this structure. Say column wise, each column of AB matrix of the result of the multiplication will be of this type. The first column will be as if as if you multiply first column and B by the whole A matrix. The second column will be as if you multiply the second column and B by the whole A matrix. They are compatible, right? I mean, the, each little b, little b2, little bk of size n1 and uh, the, a, uh, the A matrix size is mn. So they are of compatible size. You can multiply them. The result will be, that's the sizing of the result. AB1, AB2, ABK, they are the matrices of this size. 
So the everything actually fits together in this regard. Similarly, if you look at AB row-wise, each row in, in the product in AB will be as if, I mean, like the first row will be as if you took, oh, sorry, you took the first row in A and multiplied by the whole B matrix from the right this time. See, B is on the right here. And again, this is a compatible, compatible matrices. A1, little a1 of size one row n columns and b is n rows k columns so it is a compatible compatible factors for multiplication each of them and the result of these multiplications will be again row matrices one row k columns and they will fill all of these rows that's all you need to remember structure wise about matrix multiplication for the for, our, for today's discussion and actually for for every question in the yellow book where diagonalization is discussed. Okay, it's a, it's a simple observation. You, you, you know, and you did quite a few matrix multiplications before. I don't know if you ever thought of it in, in terms of rows or columns, but that's, that's, that's how you think of it in terms of rows or columns. Again, if you multiply A and B, this is as good as multiplying every row of the left factor by the right factor. See? Every row of the left factor, A, by the right factor. Or every column of the right factor, B1, B2, BK, by the left factor. That's, that's all there is to it in a very short summary. All right, so before we move on and see how the diagonal, what, what the diagonalization is and how the eigenvalues and eigenvectors helping to do that, to achieve this diagonalization purpose, I'll, I'd like to look again some on some, uh, I'd like to look at the diagonal matrices again, in fact, it's my next slide, it's called uh, Arithmetic of Diagonal Matrices. Any questions in relation to this? Okay, so Arithmetic of Diagonal Matrices, it's, look at this slide. Huh? Uh, diagonal matrices, what just happened? Oh. Uh, diagonal matrices, they are quite special in, in terms of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. It's the first example I showed you uh, in connection with eigenvalues and eigenvectors and analysis, that is eigen, eigenvalues, eigenvectors analysis of diagonal matrices. It's immediate, you don't have to do much of the computations. Uh, Diagonal matrices are also special in terms of the arithmetic. So before we do that, remember this notation I introduced back then? It was two lectures ago. That's the shorter way to write a diagonal matrix. So if G is a diagonal matrix with entries A1, A2, AN on the diagonal, and the rest is zero, you can abbreviate your writing of such a matrix into one single line like this. And I will do it a few times today. So this is just a reminder of this, uh, this efficient notation for diagonal matrices. Okay, so here, the entries, of course, not necessarily real numbers. Any field of numbers will do. Uh, remember, F all the time, it represents three possible field of numbers, either rationals, reals, or complex numbers. Uh, okay. So, in terms of, again, it's, it's all about matrix multiplication right now. On my first slide, I showed you general structure of matrix multiplication, uh, general row or column structure of matrix multiplication. When one of the factors involved in the, in the multiplication is a diagonal matrix, when one of the factors is a, is a diagonal matrix, multiplication becomes even, more, uh, even, even better structured. Look at this. If you multiply a diagonal matrix on the left by a matrix, you see this is a matrix of size Mn, R1, R2, Rn, they are the rows. Again, I just explicitly show you the row structure of the factor, of the right-hand side factor in my multiplication. So R1, Rn, they are the rows. These are the size of my rows. One row, M columns, and the matrix is n rows, m columns. 
So when you multiply two matrices, one of them is a diagonal one, diagonal factor on the left-hand side, then and the, you look at the right-hand side factor uh, from the row point of view, the result is this, look at this. All you need to do, you need to scale every row by the diagonal entries. This time, little a1, little a2, little a n, these are just numbers. They are diagonal entries. It's even simpler, simpler rule when you multiply a diagonal by another matrix. When a diagonal on the left-hand side, all you do, you take the diagonal entries and you just scale every row by the corresponding entry. That's it. S similar effect happens when you put a diagonal factor on the right-hand side rather than the left-hand side, but this time it will be column action rather than the row action. Look at this. That's, that's, a, that's a scheme where like, it's, my, it's my writing tool to present this scheme. Look at this. If you, if you have, again, a matrix of size MN, but this time, you see, I'm, I'm, I emphasize the column structure of my matrix. C1, C, N are column vectors, or just columns of my matrix. Again, the sizing here shows that clearly. When you multiply two matrices, and the, uh, one of them is diagonal, and a diagonal factor on the right-hand side, this time, the multiplication goes like this. You just, again, scale with diagonal entries of your D matrix, but this time you scale rows of the left factor rather than rows, as in here. It's a, these two ways of thinking of, di, of, of matrix multiplication, the, the, the general thinking from my first slide, when you just do row or column multiplication, or when you have one of the diagonal factors, this way of thinking of matrix multiplication is a good and actually effective structural way of thinking about that. It will help us a lot on the next two slides, actually. Next one slide. Okay. There are some uh, consequences of these general observations. For instance, if you multiply two diagonal matrices, so one of them is like this, n times n size with entries a1, an, and the second one, again, of compatible size, so it must be also square, it must be also square matrix with, with other entries, b1, b2, bn. If you just employ this way of thinking, about matrix multiplication. This time both factors are diagonal one. So actually both, way of, both ways of thinking are applicable, either A or B. Both of them are applicable. Either way, it will, the result will be the same. So if you think this way, your D on the left-hand side, you think of the second factor in terms of rows. It's the second factor in terms of rows. Each row is of this structure, 1, 2, N. It's just A replaced with B. All you need to do, you need to scale each of the rows by the diagonal entries on the left-hand side. What the result will be? What is the result of the multiplication of two diagonal matrices? It will be diagonal matrix with, with just entry-wise products of the, diag of the diagonal. It will be, again, diagonal matrix with the entries A1, B1, A2, B2, An, Bn. In terms of matrix multiplication, the, there is nothing easier to multiply but the diagonal matrices. Or in, well, in fact, multiplying even any matrix with a diagonal one is, is easy. All you need to do is to scale the rows are or the columns, depending on the order of factors. Another corollary of this, if you, compute a, if you compute an inverse to a diagonal matrix, all you need to do, you need to invert every entry on the diagonal. It comes from here, from this line. You can, easy, you can easily verify that if you multiply G with the G inverse, that will be, according to this rule, it will be a diagonal matrix with these products on with these products on, on the diagonal positions. And these are the numbers. So you end up with the diagonal matrix with identities 
on diagonal positions, which is exactly the identity matrix. Well, I, I need to have, I need to mention, of course, that uh, you can only expect an inverse to a diagonal matrix when diagonal entries are non-zero. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to, to expect an, in, an inverse, right? And it should be there shouldn't be any inverse in that case because if you have a zero entry on the diagonal, if you have any zeros here on the diagonal, it would mean that that particular column is non-leading one. So your row echelon form is uh, uh, having like a having a leading column that's why the matrix is not invertible well in the final final property which is linked to this which I mentioned on this slide is that if you go for for a power of a diagonal matrix again because of this simple structure of matrix of the diagonal matrix multiplication all you need to do you need to compute the powers of the diagonal entries, which are numerical powers. And that, that works for any k, positive or negative or even zero. That works for any k. Any questions? This is my preparation for actually for the next slide where we're going to sh I'm going to show you how the eigenvalues and eigenvectors they help to achieve what is called diagonalization of the matrix. Why exactly it's so valuable diagonalization? You will learn soon, and you will probably learn uh, further. I mean, like further you go for the for your mathematical study, you will learn even more why diagonalization is so important. But there will be some incentives even in this in this topic. Uh, but right now we right now we just let's just see what the diagonalization is, and any questions so far? Yeah, here it is. Diagonalization of of matrix. It's how to find a matrix which is a diagonal on one hand and which is linked to the original one through a so-called similarity relation. It all will be explained in, on this slide. So what I'm going to talk about, it, it only works for square matrices. Like, in fact, eigenvalues and eigenvectors is something which was only introduced for square matrices. There is no any other setting where you can introduce eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we start off with the square matrix of size n. I'll make an assumption that we know eigenvalues of that matrix. See, m of them, and now we I'll make the assumption assumption that we know eigenvectors associated with that eigenvalues. So they come in pairs. That's a pair of eigenvalue and eigenvector. Another pair of eigenvalue of eigenvector. Another pair, and so on. In general, we just I assume that we we, we don't know all of the eigenvalues. So we just know m of them, even though the size of the matrix is n. By now, I hope you remember that matrix in uh, every matrix in principle, any matrix of size n, must have exactly n eigenvalues. It's just a question of finding them because all of them will be solution to to the characteristic polynomial, which is of degree n. Right. So here's my sequence of eigenvalues. Here's a sequence of eigenvectors. So is the defining property of its eigenvalue and eigenvector. This pair, it's connected through this relation. Next pair, connected through this relation. For each of such pairs, for each of these M pairs, we have such a relation. It's just what, what we call an eigenvalue, an eigenvector. That's right. So look what you're going to do often in the yellow book. When you know this, when you, when you discover this setting, when you computed all of the components in this setting, when you computed all of the eigenvalues, all of the eigenvectors, and the next step which will be required, well, which will, you will do on, in many questions in the yellow book is this. You will build a special matrix, P, 
which consists of these vectors as columns, you see? And hence, the size of my matrix, you see? N rows, because each of these vectors is n-dimensional, and M columns, because we have M vectors all together. You build such a matrix of these vectors as columns, and that will be very valuable matrix because look what it, it will do for you, what it will do for many questions. If you attempt to compute the product of A and P, these are two matrices, they are of compatible size, isn't it? Because the, here you have N uh, columns and here is N rows, so, so they are of compatible size. They, in principle, can be multiplied together. And if you do that, you can employ this structural view from my first slide, isn't it? When you multiply two factors, two matrix, matrix factors, you can multiply every column of the right factor by the left factor. That's something we discovered with you on my first slide. That's what, I'm, what, that's what I'm about to do. Look at this. Every column of my right factor, I'll multiply by A. Here it is. The result will be a matrix with columns like this. First column will be AX1. Second column will be AX2. Last one will be AXM. But now we can, we, can, we can remember that these products, they, are, they have some extra, extra properties. They have these properties. We can replace them with the reference size here because the x vectors, they are the eigenvectors for my A matrix. So if I do the replacement, that's the kind of matrix I will have. This is a, this is a matrix. I'm just writing the columns of this matrix explicitly, and these are the columns of my new matrix explicitly. And then I can use the, my observation from the slide, from the second slide today. Because look what happens here. Every column in this matrix, every column in this matrix is scaled by the number lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda m. Such an effect can be achieved by multiplying with a diagonal factor. From my, from my slide before, I know if I multiply a matrix by a diagonal one from the right hand side, this is as good as multiplying every column, scaling every column by the diagonal entries. And that's what I see here. I see every column scaled by some number. If I single out all of these numbers into a diagonal matrix, if I introduce G, a diagonal matrix with my eigenvalues on the diagonal, the same effect, the same effect, like I see here, can be achieved by doing this simple product by multiplying my original P with G on the right hand side. And that's the value of my P matrix. Look at this, the P matrix which I constructed here from my eigenvectors, it works like this. That's the identity we need to keep in mind for the rest of this chapter. This is something which I call semi Semi diagonalization. I'll explain why I say semi. There will be a full diagonalization with no semi prefix, but this, this identity, AP equals PD, it is what I call semi diagonalization. And that is actually one single identity, AP equals PD, it just compresses all of this, all of this setting in one single identity. All of it is just sitting here. Through this, through this argument. It's very, if, very effective, very condensed way to write a lot of things. That, that the columns of P are eigenvectors of the matrix A with these eigenvalues. Because you can, you can work it out in reverse. You can work it out in reverse if, if G is a diagonal matrix and P is the one which consists of columns like any matrix consists of columns, then the left-hand side will be exactly scaling of, of, co of P columns with lambda values, and the right-hand side will be multiplying P columns with A like this. When you think about that, you will realize everything we discussed with you about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors is just condensed in one single identity like this. AP equals PG. And that's what I call semi-diagonalization. I call it semi-diagonalization for one reason. For the reason that this P is not square matrix, because we, this M is not necessarily 
this n, that's the size of my matrix, n p, sorry, n m. However, however, if it happens, if it happens that you have all of the eigenvectors at your disposal here, if if it happens that if it happens that m is equal n, and it, that will often happen in the yellow book, and if also that's a bit harder to achieve. This one basically will always happen because we know for every matrix of size n, there will be exactly n different eigenvalues. Uh, not, not, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Not, not, specific, not, not particularly different, but there will be n eigenvalues. Well, maybe with multiplicities, but there will be n eigenvalues. The second requirement will be harder to achieve, but if this n vectors now, they are linearly independent. If you have this extra extra requirement, first one, first extra requirement that you have n eigenvalues, and the second requirement that the eigenvectors, all of them n, are linearly independent. If you have these two extra requirements, then this identity AP equals PG, it will be now a full diagonalization identity. And the reason for that is just, just about to follow. Look at this, because when you have all of these columns linearly independent, your P matrix, it becomes square matrix, M equals N. With linearly independent columns, it becomes invertible matrix. It becomes invertible matrix. And what you can do is this. You can take this identity, AP equal PD, you can multiply this identity by P inverse on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and you will end up with the with a relation like this. You can convert your A matrix via such transformation into a diagonal one. And that is, this is what is called the diagonalization of matrix A without semi-prefix. So the difference between semi and full diagonalization is here that the P is invertible matrix. If you have an invertible matrix, that's a full diagonalization. That's the, that's the best you can wish for. And that's the best you can wish. Of course, you can also multiply. You can, you can take this one. You can multiply by P, ta oh, sorry. P times from the left and P inverse on the right, if you take this identity and you do another transformation to it, if you multiply left and the right hand side by two extra factors, one of them P from the left hand side and the other one P inverse from the right hand side, you will also have this relation, A in terms of your G. Each of these, they are equivalent to each other. You can, try, you can always go from one to another via something like this, by introducing these factors P and P inverse on the left and the right hand side in the right in the, in, the, in the correct order. So, and you can always move from one identity to the other one. That's why these two are indistinguishable. We, both of them I, I call in yellow book, both of them calls, calls diagonalization of the matrix A relation. But if you trace it back, if you trace it back, it's all here. It's all in our understanding of column and row structure of matrix multiplication and the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. If you understand all that, if you keep this in mind, it will make your life with the yellow book in this chapter when you discuss, when we discuss uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it will make your life a lot easier. From this moment on, I mean, I can't fully convince you that this relation is very important for the applications. One day you will learn it. You will learn it even a little bit in the yellow book. Though there will be questions which you can't do unless you, you have something like this. But you will learn it even further, further, further down your career track. Uh, those of you who will continue study uh, spectral analysis or apply spectral analysis. Uh, from, from the current point of view, from the current point of view, we need to discuss now how to achieve this full diagonalization. I mean, semi-diagonalization is always achievable now from, from our perspective because finding these eigenvalues and finding these eigenvectors, we know how to do that. I showed you this on a few examples already in, in my two preceding lectures, and it's basically a routine steps. It's, it's, it's a lengthy process, but it's, it's, a, it's a process you, 
you don't have to uh, think much, just to step after step, carefully you first find the characteristic polynomial, then you solve for the roots of that polynomial, then for each of the root, which is the eigenvalue, you solve the homogeneous system, you find your eigenvectors. This setting you can find. So semi-diagonalization, we know how to do that. The next step I'd like to discuss with you how to make the jump from semi-diagonalization to the full diagonalization, so how to achieve this and this. Well, actually, mostly this. How to achieve linear independence of the eigen eigenvectors. Because if you don't have them linearly independent, or if you don't have, don't have enough of them, if you have less than n, then you, you won't be able to recover this diagonalization relation in full with the inverse p. And this is a harder study. In fact, uh, you probably in this topic, you will never see a complete answer which covers every possibility. In fact, there is no such answer to cover every possibility. There are matrices. It's a, it's a, it's a good point. Actually, it's objective, actual objective difficulty. It's not something which is, depends on the person who does it. It's a, it's a I mean, in nature of the spectral analysis. There are matrices for which you cannot achieve this. And these are the bad kind of matrices. People struggle with them a lot harder than with the other ones. And they develop a more complex methods how to, how to deal with them. So this part is not always, I mean, these two parts, they are not always achievable. The good news for you, in the yellow book, probably you won't see many of those examples. Probably you won't see, well, maybe you see one or two, but it will be like a, just to show you that there are complexities beyond beyond this level um, yeah in the yellow book most of the time you, this, this this full diagonalization will be achievable and you need to know the tests or the methods how to how to see that so how to see how to find the exactly n linearly independent eigenvectors because if you do have them you can always convert your semi diagonalization into full diagonalization like through something like this Okay. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, here. Why? No. If you multiply by P inverse on both sides, this P inverse will just stick to the left-hand side. This P inverse on the left-hand side will kill this P. On this side, Ah, actually, we don't need this. I'm sorry. This, we just don't need this. It is just, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You don't, you have, um, you, actually, it's a thank you. It's a good observation. We don't, what the heck is here? Yeah, I actually, I just realized what happened. To convert this semi-diagonalization into full diagonalization, you, you need only one of these factors. You don't need this factor. Yeah, that's, that's what you do. You just multiply by P inverse on the left-hand side, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side of your identity. This P inverse will stick here. It will be P inverse AP. On the, the right-hand side, P inverse just kills this factor, and it will be just D. So that will be this. The, the reason the P inverse was on the other side is just if you multiply the P inverse on the other side, if you use P inverse here and you don't use this factor, then from this one, you will come down to this. Because P inverse on the left-hand side will kill this presence, the presence of this P. Here, it will be just P, G, P inverse, like in here. So that's, that's why I, I, I had two, two factors on both sides, because I think it's just the last time I made this presentation, I just typed it up, and I kept it there. You, you're right. Thank you very much. I don't need both of the factors to come, to come from this line down to this line. Any more questions? So uh, the next thing we're going to discuss is when, like I said, in general, there's no like a silver bullet here. You can't, not only you, can, you cannot expect that this happens all the time, even when it happens, there are instances where it's very hard to see if, like, how it happens and why it happens. So we, we will study this gradually. The easiest case we will see today, one of the easiest cases where when this happens and you can achieve full diagonalization, I will show you today. It's my it's, this is my next slide.
It's a slide which I call uh, systems of eigen, uh, eigenvectors. It's one of the easiest tests, which shows you that the, you have uh, linearly independent eigenvectors. There are other tests which are harder, and there are cases when there's no any test to help you, and there are cases when they are not linearly independent. All of these possibilities exist, but we start with the easier one. So again, it's the same setting. I have a matrix. I have matrix of size n times n. I have sequence of eigenvalues, sequence of eigenvectors, not necessarily as many as the dimension of the matrix. It's the same setting from the slide before. The simplest test you have in your you'll have in your pocket when you do questions, that's the one which I call lemma here, is this. If your eigenvalues are pairwise distinct, so there's no any duplicates between them, then you save. Then the associated sequence of eigenvectors is linearly independent. That's the easiest test in existence, and most of the time it will cover questions in the yellow book. There are harder tests. There will be probably a few examples, but this is the easiest one you have, and that's the one we, we, we have enough knowledge to see right now. Yeah, right now. It's a nice proof. We have about 10 minutes to, to, to see it, but probably we'll finish even quicker than that. Let's just, let's just see it. I mean, the proof makes sense only when m is bigger than 2. When m is 1, the claim is a, is a trivial claim because uh, a system of one vector is always linearly independent as long as the vector is non-zero. And for, for the case of eigenvectors, they are non-zero. It, it is in a definition of the eigenvectors. Eigenvectors are always non-zero. So the proof only makes sense, I mean, the, the, uh, the essential part of the proof is the, when m is at least 2. That's, why I fig that's what I fix here. So I can also make the assumption that the at least n take 1 of my values are non-zero. Otherwise, I mean, it, it comes from here. It means that with, within this set, they, they, there will be at least one, at, sorry, at most one zero. Otherwise, you'll have duplicates, and that will contradict to the assumption. So within this set of the eigen, eigenvalues, there will be at most one zero, and I make a specific assumption where exactly the zero, if there is a zero, where it is. So I just, I kept my zero. If there is a zero, I kept it in the mth place. So I make an assumption that the first m take one values are Definitely non-zero. It's a legitimate assumption, without making any restrictions and uh, onto, without putting any restrictions on the argument. So we're going to prove by contradiction. So we'll make the assumption that the vectors are in fact linearly dependent. We make an assumption that my vectors are in fact linearly dependent. I'll, I'll, I'll try to see a contradiction in such an assumption. All right, I hope by now you, you're more or less comfortable with your linear dependence and linear independence. Uh, if, if a set of vectors is linearly dependent, it means I can produce I can produce a linear combination of those vectors, with, which, which is zero on one hand, and such that not every, not every coefficient here is zero. Again, without, without losing much of a generality, I'll make the assumption that the first coefficient is non-zero. Otherwise, I can re-index stuff and make it the first one. In fact, in fact, there must be two coefficients on zero, right? It, there can't be just one coefficient on zero. If, if only one is on zero, if the rest of the coefficients is zero, then you have just, you'll have just a, uh, you, you have alpha one x one equals zero, which is, which is wrong. I mean, x one vector, it's the eigenvector. It cannot be zero vector. So in fact, by making an assumption, by making an assumption that you have, that the vectors are linearly dependent, meaning that you have a linear combination which is zero, but at least one coefficient is not zero, I can alter this in saying at least two coefficients are non-zero. 
because if exactly one is non-zero, if it's like exactly alpha one is non-zero, then it is a contradiction straight away. So I can make the assumption that the among the rest of the alphas from two to m, there is another one which is non-zero. So here we go. Uh, that's my original setting. I have my vectors, which I assume to be linearly dependent. I have the linear combination of such vectors, which with a specific property it is zero, and that at least two coefficients here are non-zero. One of them is the first one. What I will do now, here's the actual proof now, what I will do is this. I'll take my matrix and I multiply this identity by my matrix, left-hand side and the right-hand side. So I will do this. The whole left-hand side is, is getting multiplied by A, and the whole right-hand side is getting multiplied by A. Well, right-hand side is zero, so the result will be zero, but on the left-hand side, we can do some transformations. I can do the expansion, and now we'll do the expansion. So here's the expansion. Capital A is multi, uh, uh, capital A get, uh, gets next to X1, X2, Xm, and now I can employ the fact that x1, x2, xm are eigenvectors for my A matrix. If I employ that fact, I can replace every of these terms, ax1, ax2, axm, with the corresponding scalings, lambda1, x1, lambda2, x2, lambda m, xm. That's the replacement. This is a step. This is a step, this one, where we use the fact that x1, x2, xm are eigenvectors for my A matrix. We're almost there. What I will do now is this, I will, because I have that my lambda 1 is non-zero 1, I can, I can cancel by lambda 1, so here's my canceling. If I divide everything by lambda 1, I can do it because of this assumption. So just lambda 1 appears in the denominator across the rest of the factors, and lambda 1 disappears from the first, across the rest of the terms, I'm sorry, and lambda 1 disappears in the first term. And then what I will do, I'll take my original identity from here, and I will subtract it from here. Basically, from this step on, from this step onwards, I'm just trying to get rid of, the, of this term altogether. I'm trying to get rid of the presence of x1 and lambda 1, and I can do, uh, sorry, alpha 1, x1, and I can do it by now subtracting this whole bit from here. That will cancel, that will cancel this presence, there will be something here, there will be something here, and that's exactly what, it, what will be there. So the, the joint coefficient next to x2, next to x2 vector will be this bit, take this alpha 2 right in here. The joint coefficient next to x3 will be similarly alpha 3, lambda 3 by lambda 1, take 1. This is a joint coefficient next to xm vector here. It's a joint coefficient next to x3 vector here. I can make some abbreviations. I can call this joint coefficient with a new name, say beta 1 or beta 2. Probably would, would be a better better choice. Next one will be beta three. Last one I will call beta m. It's just a naming. But what what is what's important about this set of coefficients is this. Listen to this. Before before we made the observation that there is a non-zero one between the set from two to m, in alphas between the set of from two to m, which means that among these alphas there will be at least one non-zero. And here's the place where I'm finally going, I'm, where I'm finally is going to use this assumption. So far, there wasn't a single place in my proof where this assumption was important. I didn't use that. I, make, I didn't make any reference to that. But now I will. Because of this assumption, because all of my alphas are pairwise distinct, all of these brackets are non-zero. For each of such brackets to be zero, your alpha 1 must be equal to one of these lambdas in the enumerator. Given my assumption, all of them pairwise distinct, neither of these brackets is zero. So if you combine this together with the fact that among alphas from 2 to m there is one non-zero, 
I claim now that between betas, I claim now that one of betas, wrong one, one of my betas, which are the names for these factors in here, is non-zero, and that's how it looks, right? This expression, if you use my beta notation, that's how it looks. So, here's my case for contradiction now. We started off with the assumption that this set from one to m of vectors, of vectors x from one to m is linearly dependent, and we came down to the conclusion that the smaller set, where we dropped x1 away from it, is also linearly dependent, isn't it? Look at this. It's a smaller combination, which equals zero, and not every, every coefficient in that combination is zero. It means that the smaller set is also linearly dependent. And that's my case for contradiction. Now, if I repeat this whole step once, once again with betas now, rather than alphas, I can make my set even smaller. I can drop another vector from it, x2. And then I can drop x3, and I can drop x4, and I can drop all of them until I reach only one vector. And for that vector, this conclusion will still stand. It's linearly dependent, but that's, that's a contradiction. One vector which is non-zero, all of my eigenvectors are non-zero, cannot be linearly dependent. Here's how you see the contradiction. It's a repetitive argument. It's only one step of this argument. You need to repeat this step another m take one times to reduce the set to only one vector, and then finally you will arrive at the proper contradiction. That's how this proof goes. Even, even here you can see how it, it's, we, you, we're entering quite, it's quite, a, quite a difficult area now. Of, of, I mean, look, it's the next level of mathematics. Those of you who will continue your career in mathematics, you will enter even deeper in this area. But it just shows you, even I told you that this is one of the simplest tests you'll have for your yellow book. This, this is one of the simplest tests you have for your yellow book. You can see the complexity of the argument which supports that test. It requires this repetitive, repetitive argument for m take one times to see a contradiction. But now you have, it, you, you have this test and you can use it successfully in the yellow book. Not only you have the test, you also have the argument behind this test. It's an important piece of the argument. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, there will be a few places where we'll need the argument as well, not only the, not only the statement itself. Any questions? If you don't have any questions, next time we will practice diagonalization. We'll practice this test next time. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Thank you.